to the Fort Bend Chamber of Commerce Government Division webinar. I want to thank you for taking the time today to participate in the event. My name is Christopher Bro, and I'm the division chair of the Fort Bend Chamber's Government Division, the only five-star accredited chamber in the greater Houston region. As an advocate for excellent in Fort Bend County and beyond, the chamber serves both our community partners and our community. Before we get started today, I want to recognize our sponsor for this event, uh, Republic Services. And we have uh, Brother David Aguilar with us. David, would you like to say a few words? Yes, thank you, for Christopher. Hi, my name is David Aguilar. I'm with Republic Services. We just want to thank the Fort Bend Chamber for allowing us to sponsor this uh, webinar with Congressman Pete Olson. And uh, everybody stay safe. Uh, look forward to seeing everybody someday soon in person. Great. Thanks, Dave. And thank you, Republic Services, for all you do for our community and support of the Chamber. Appreciate you, man. Um, I'd like to remind everyone about the chat feature. I think I'm pointing down there. I think that works down at the bottom of your box there uh, with Zoom. Uh, please feel free to type in uh, any questions you might have, and we'll get those to the Congressman uh, as he concludes his talk, or maybe in the middle of his talk, uh, and uh, make that happen. Uh, I, you know, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, U.S. Congressman Pete Olson. Uh, uh, Congressman Olson was sworn in uh, to represent the 22nd District uh, of Texas in 2009. Uh, in his second term in Congress, he was appointed to the House Energy and Commerce Committee, the oldest standing legislative committee in the U.S. House of Representatives. Upon re-election for a sixth term in the 116th Congress, uh, Pete was uh, remained on the Energy Commerce Committee as the Energy Subcommittee and Communications Technology Subcommittee. Uh, he was also appointed to serve on the Science, Space, and Technology Committee and sits on the Space and Aeron Aeronautics Subcommittees. And so I'm going to turn it over to uh, our friend, Congressman Pete Olson. Well, Chris, thank you so much. And thank you to our friends at Republic for being the sponsors of today's lunch. And guys and gals, this is the future. I had no idea what Zoom was until about six weeks ago, and now I'm Zooming every single day. So thank y'all for coming, and thank the Chamber of Commerce. As Chris mentioned, our chamber, on paper, it's a five-star chamber, one of 82 out of 777 chambers. A rise guy, that is 1.16 our chambers have the five-star ratio. But as you can see over my left shoulder, this one's special. We are a 15-star chamber. We don't stop at five. We keep going to 15. Only one in the country, and that's the Fort Bend Chamber of Commerce. And we have been going through some tough times with this pandemic crisis, as we all know. COVID-19 kind of came out of nowhere, surprised us in many ways. The fact that you can't know you have it for maybe 14 days, real challenge. But I think we've done a pretty darn good job with bouncing care, recovery, and treatment, and also getting our economy, our business open again. And y'all have been a great help with that, especially with what's called the PPP, the Payroll Protection Program. That's coming from U.S. Treasury, the IRS, the SBA. And as you guys know, Congress has tackled this thing pretty hard with three bills. The first bill, let me get some numbers here, was called, it basically was for first responders and just about $4 billion. First responders, get them going, get the medical people protected. The second tranche of money was for families. And these bills passed with huge majorities, maybe three or four dissents in the House out of 435, maybe one or two in the Senate. The last one was passed was the big enchilada, so to speak. That's what authorized PPP and also the EIDL, big programs that got our small business going again. The PPP has been pretty darn amazing. I mean, the Washington Post even said, the Washington Post said the PPP might have saved our economy. It had a rough start. We ran out of money very quickly, but we made some adjustments. And please, if you haven't applied, get out there and apply. It's fairly simple. You can do it online with paper, whatever, but please apply. We still have, let me get the numbers here for you. We 
We still have over $130 billion out there for small business. So there's money out there. The deadline has been extended to file. And also we in Congress passed a, another law last week that drops requirement basically is payroll protection. You have to keep your employees on salary at the same expense, at the same level. We dropped that 75% of your expenses had to cover that. That goes down now at 60%. So a little more flexibility how you spend your money. And so talk to the chamber, talk to Chris, talk to Carrie, talk to the SBA, talk, come to me. But if you need, need this money, please, please, please apply. And the pandemic crisis, I give it made great progress. All I can say is keep wearing your mask, keep washing your hands, and keep six feet away. Again, with all this diversity here, this huge population, these rally, rallies, masses of people come together, the whole George Floyd crisis. And guys, that was horrific, what happened in Minnesota. Anybody who's a human being can't say that was law enforcement. That was a thug guy in a uniform. And he'll have his day in court. And we did a great job with George Floyd coming home, a great rally downtown, over 60,000 people rallied with very little vandalism, very little arrest, just honoring George and his legacy, and had a service here for him the day before yesterday. He was buried in Pearland yesterday, and thank you, thank you, thank you. We said goodbye to George Floyd the way it should have been said. And so with that, I'll take some questions, because just so glad to be here. Great, thanks, Pete. Hey, um, uh, and we do appreciate you being here today. Uh, what do you expect? You, 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 you talked about a few of the, the bills that have, have come out, uh, and, and there are a lot. And you'd say there's a lot of money left over there. Uh, we had a, a session this morning to try to hit some of the folks who, who weren't able to or, or didn't take advantage of the PPP uh, through some other, some other funding, federal funding. But what, um, what do you expect in terms of continuing support for businesses regarding COVID-19 recovery? Do you expect anything else down the line? Well, Chris, we've talked about having another stimulus package. The House passed one that's going to go nowhere. The Senate will pass it. And this, this missed a target, I think, because it addressed stuff like making sure we have absentee voting for every election, no ballot boxes, no going to vote, the ballot box. Like, that's going to happen in November. Let's focus on what's happening right here in mid-June. We have businesses who are just hanging on by a thread. They're open up. And Chris, that, as I mentioned, taking that level down from 75 to 6% is huge for our restaurants because they got hit hard. The restaurants were shut down, and then they opened up. We had some guys tell us, well, <laughs> great that I'm, I'm in the second tranche here, the second opening, but I'm limited because Texas says I can only open to 25% capacity. So I'm paying the people if I got the PPP as I would have paid them before, and now they're not working. And so this doesn't work. At some point, I'm going to have to lay them off and maybe break the, cut, the PPP rules and face some big fine. So we addressed that by lowering the number and extending the, the, the coverage window just to get this out there because, guys, don't be afraid to ask for help. We're proud of Texas, and Texas don't ask, I like to ask for help, but please ask for help. It's not something you've done wrong at all. Nobody saw this virus coming. Nobody could see the impact it had on our economy. The fact that I flipped to D.C., every time I flew there, the plane's been almost full. It was me and seven congressmen a couple of weeks ago. That's it. I saw Peter Wells, from, he's from Vermont, fly back home to Vermont. Pete has old plane, 737, Pete Welch Express. It was just Peter Welch. Now, the planes are getting full, more full. The cruise lines are having a bad time, but our local restaurants, and they're the second largest employer in the country as a group, and they're taking a big hit. And so go there, go through the drive-thru, you know, walk up, take out, and go have a dinner now, but comply with those social distancing rules. Well, uh, thanks, Pete. Yeah, that's, uh, it is difficult for the, the restaurants with the, the, the social distancing requirements there. And, and you know, most of them are, are, um, are designed to be operating at full capacity to make any money. Yep, yep. And that's a small profit margin, Chris. As you know, right. those guys are just baby of money. It's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a little difficult there. Uh, and, and so basically we're kind of, we're going to going with this whole process. You guys are you know, just feeling your way along 
uh, I guess, on the, on the funding and that sort of thing, which, which you can do and how this, it looks like you've made some changes to the, um, uh, the PPP to yeah, adapt. Yeah, we learned, Chris, we learned, Chris, as we go. For example, when Texas did their sort of phase comeback, you know, sort of the plan, you know, opening one, opening two, reopening one, reopening two, that's when we found out that, hey, the PPP rules don't work very well with going to 25% of your workforce. We have to pay for a full workforce. It's like, uh-oh. So we adjusted that, made that, again, got that a little bit lower, not that high measure. And please let us know, because this is, it's created warm jello. This is, nobody saw this coming. We're learning as we go. We've made great progress, yes, but there's things we can fix. And again, there'll be another round, but it looks like next week's going to be addressing the police issue, what happened with, with our good friend there, our, our fellow Texan, fellow Houstonian up there, George Lloyd in Minneapolis. Yeah, and a, a technical question, uh, Pete, on, on these, um, uh, on the, the PPP and that sort of thing, or, or just do the, do the, um, the federal agencies, I guess the SBA that's running this, do they have, they have flexibility is all, or does all the real flexibility have to come through legislative action? <laughs> They have a lot. They have a lot of flexibility, Chris. We got out of the way. Just said, "Here's your, here's your caps. Here's the rules. Make it happen." And then they said, "Some of the guys affected by this, as I mentioned, said, I'm kind of in a bind here because I'm tied down by my state how I can run my business with my employees, not to have full employment. But you guys maybe keep full employment to keep the PPP money. It, it's not fit. It's clashing, and so." We adjust that somewhat and let us know more. That was unintended, but it's real. Okay. And let us know. There's some issues, you know, some of the big guys, like we all saw Firehouse Subs. Hey, they got a lot of money, but they gave it back and let us know too. A lot of those guys just said, listen, I didn't realize it was legal. It opened okay. the door. I'm not going to turn away money. Yeah. But I can raise money. These small businesses can't. They don't have the private sector power that I have. So, okay, I'll give it back. Well, Pete, what do you what do you think is the most important thing for for the, the average citizen and the business owners in, in District 22 to remember in times like these? I think the best thing, as I mentioned earlier, Chris, is please don't be afraid to ask for help. We as Texans are kind of proud people just by who we are. The crazy people who came as crazy hot states and we can make this a place for cattle and cotton and crops. Hey, let's take on this big country called Mexico. Let's take them on a small church with over 4,000 troops and less than 200 of our guys getting massacred. Let's flee across the state and go to San Jacinto, take one last shot, win victory, and then be so in debt that we have to join America. My point is, Texans always overcome, but that's because we're not afraid to ask for help. So please, please, please don't drown. Don't be too proud. Call me up, call Chris up, call the chamber, any chamber in the region but ask for help because it's out there. Okay, thanks. Well, let, let's, I'm, I'm gonna get a little personal here, uh, Congressman Olson. What, what do you like best about uh, serving District 22? Just the people, Chris. I mean, we are America in a nutshell, pure and simple. We have every sector here of our industry, our economy of transportation, medical, you name it. We got high tech, got you know, restaurants, and especially the diversity. I mean, this place, the diversity is so amazing. The fact that in our schools, over 80 languages are spoken in classrooms all across Fort Bend County. And that's make this place so great. And oh, by the way, America sees that, because guess what's the largest and bigger is always better congressional district in America, Texas 22. We're over a million people right now Congressional size less before last census was about 725,000 people. So we're a quarter of a million beyond that right now and growing. And that makes this place such a great, great place to represent Congress. Our diversity, the way we come together, it doesn't matter. Harvey showed that. Be, you would see people out there getting out of these raging waves of water that were streets before, cars being swept away. They lock arms. They lock arms with, I don't care where that person goes to church, where they came from the world, how much money they have. That person, that car, don't know who they are. I'm going to rescue them. And what makes us great, too, is we don't wait for D.C. 
disaster happens, just like this COVID-19 crisis. We want the help, but we're not waiting for it. We're stepping out and helping our neighbors and getting by. I hear you. Well, Pete, you know, you talk about the growth, the growth of the district now, and I guess every, every 10 years there's an opportunity, right, uh, to redistrict. What do you, do you see anything in the redistricting of 22? I guess we'll be smaller geographically. Yeah, Chris, we've got to take a cut somewhere. Can the numbers will come out, please. The census is happening right now. Chris has gotten on the chain right now. And I said, please fill it out. You do it online via phone call, you know, send a letter. I did it online. It took maybe 10 minutes. It wasn't very invasive, just basically, who are you? Who lives with you? How are they related? What are their ages? That's it. It was nothing else about that. And where you go to church was just, you know. And so please fill out that census because that's money for Texas. All these federal grants, a lot are dependent upon your population. If we're undercounted, guess what? That could be money going to New York or California or Florida or Montana. That's our taxpayer dollars going to support their states. Let's bring that money back home. You do that by filling out the census. And Chris, Texas picked out four seats, the last census, four congressional seats, twice as much as any other state. The most they picked up was two. We're picking up at least three this time. And that'll be the most in the country because we have this great business climate with the 15-star chamber here in Fort Bend County. And also just local governments, you know, the city and the county in Austin want to work with business, not being a poet, but, an ad, but friendly. Support them. And that's why people are coming here in droves. Well, well, Pete, let me ask you on uh, District 22, what would you like to see happening in District 22 over the next decade? And, or, and, and what does your, um, uh, the, the first in, person who's going to succeed you, your successor, what, what do they need to know about District 22? Uh, Chris, I think I'd like to see is just keep on doing what we're doing. Okay, keep ahead, but keep, don't be afraid of this growth. This growth is a good thing, this growth. I mean, again, if I could talk to, any of us could talk to, oh, guys, name like maybe George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or James Adams or James Monroe or James Madison, guys who wrote the Constitution said, what would be your ideal county in America that you thought would be, was your dream for this country? That it's almost 250 years down the road, but which one is the model? They'd say, Fort Bend County. It's so diverse. Religion doesn't matter there. You have Muslims living next to Hindus, living next to Christians, to Jews, to Sikhs. I mean, and we all come together as a melting pot. Harvey showed that. Whatever we have, just our schools. Our schools are amazing. And you go to our schools, and it's like going to the United Nations. And I tell the guy who succeeds me, or gal who succeeds me, please embrace this adversity. It is a great thing about Fort Benton County. And don't be afraid to go have a spicy hot Indian food meal or some spicy. <laughs> Embrace the cultures. Very good. Very good. Well, Pete, you know, we, we, we talk about like, you know, you're, you're, you're fixing to leave office here, but my gosh, there's what, six months left of, uh, did I get that right? Six or seven months left of. of January 3rd at 12 noon Eastern time, Chris. All right. The Constitution. You got it right. <laughs> And not that I'm counting. Had the cocktail ready? Yeah, not your counting. Right, I got you. Well, what do, what do you hope to accomplish before before January? Well, Chris, a couple of things. I want to get. Uh, I want to keep working our our flood controlled infrastructure. We learned a lot about Hurricane Harvey. How we had some Achilles heels, like we had those two big reservoirs up there, the Barker and the Attics. That the stuff came over the top. We have to find a way to capture that water and make us more resilient. So that's my one one big policy issue. I've got a bill called, it's time now, this before, I introduced this about four months ago, it's called the No Hate Act. And basically it's an act that, it's modeled on some of the laws we have, but remember James Byrd, the text was killed by basis of Ku Klux Klan people out there in Vider a couple of years ago. Matthew Shepard, another man was killed because of his sexual orientation. It's based on those laws. We see, Chris, that human trafficking and hate crimes are underreported because it's not good for a community to say, I'm a community of hate or I'm a community of sex trafficking. It's like, 
but this encourages the local law enforcement people to A, report it, and B, will give you training to realize this may be some hate crime, so take a whole different stance from looking for evidence as opposed to just a normal situation that may look like just some sort of confrontation between two people. And this is a, this words are real rare in DC, these real rare. Chris, this is bipartisan, Democrat and Republican, and bicameral. Same language, House and Senate. So we're hoping that maybe this situation to happen in Minneapolis can get, get this broken through, get that passed. And then the other thing is just transportation, making sure we have the road structure and the railroad structure. And get that Grand Parkway built going through the southwest part, going down to Alvin and Mandel area, because that's Achilles heel right now, the whole road infrastructure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, well, you know, someone, someone's asked a question here, Pete, about uh, what, what is Congress going to, what is going on in Congress to assist with protecting uh, business and consumer uh, liability wise? And I, they're not quite clear here, but. Yeah, that's, that's big. Yeah. Mitch McCall has said, the leader said, the next bill for PPP or anything like that for the COVID-19 crisis will have some liability protection in it now. That's caused some objection from the other side of the aisle because they don't like that but chris we got to have that i mean you got to know if somebody gets pops positive with some covid 19 they may go after the doctor the ambulance driver the hospital where they're taken who knows where they in or the restaurant they might have got infected we have to have some protection for these people and that's we're hoping that'll be the part of the next but again it looks like this next few weeks we'll be looking at this whole uh, police brutality issue, stepping up what happened in Minneapolis. But I've got my eye on making sure that we pass something for COVID-19 that has some liability protection for small businesses that are just doing their job. No fault of their own, something bad happened, but, but you can't control it. I mean, it's so crazy, Chris. I go to s s hospitals now or fly the airlines. I get just walk up automatically, pull my mask down, they take my temperature, put it up. We've changed, but the point is that protection, that's all you can do. That may not protect the virus from spreading, so you can't be liable because I did all I could do. Listen, I have limits, and there's did nothing wrong. But sadly, some people try to use this to make some money. Yeah, it seems like you would have some, you know, some some level of responsibility, you know, for conducting a, a business that's, that's safe, um, but but you can't control everything, and it's um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Kick truck walks in there. The fact that listen, I was fine, and then I got home a week later after I went to a restaurant. Then I got a fever and a little cough. I'm sorry. I guess the doctors told me, boy, I went to a restaurant. I had that in my body. So, oh, that person at your restaurant got it too. Oh, you're the bad person. No, no, you're not a bad person. Yeah. You're just overwhelmed by this virus, like many of us were. Right. And so I'm hoping I'm going to push hard. The next thing that deals with the COVID-19 to have something protect our small businesses in that bill because it's got to happen. Okay. Well, I've got a question and I don't know, uh, let me ask, you know, so, so someone talked about uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Fauci, you know, uh, uh, pushing for mandatory vaccines. I don't know that necessarily the case, um, but because I don't think man, I don't think vaccines are mandatory, but they certainly are suggested. Um, uh, uh, do, you have, do you have any thoughts on 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 vaccine? I mean, we don't have one yet. It'd be great to have one, but do you have any thoughts on? on yeah, that? Chris, we expect it. They take a long time. President Trump has done a good job cutting some bureaucracy to get those to the market. There may be a one out, Chris. They say it takes about a year because Dr. Fox has been a big proponent of that, but he says, "Listen, you can't. You cut some quarters, but you can't. You know, basically a vaccine. You put the virus in a." we can form into a human's body. So if we don't test this properly, we can make it worse by injecting and making people sick. But I've never heard him say it's mandatory. Uh, that's, it's all our vaccines, like smallpox, all the vaccines, you know, polio vaccine, they're not mandatory. I guess polio may have been because we all have that scar, but then we sort of learn a lesson here because you know, vaccines, there's some people out there that no vaccine, no vaccine, this is their body. Okay, if they don't want a vaccine, we can't, Force, but I don't think to do that, but we can encourage them and hopefully get one out there because you've got one for Ebola. 
after the Ebola crisis. You know, it's a very small number because it's not needed, but we have a vaccine now for it. Right, right, absolutely. So, so we're, I mean, folks are working hard to make that sort of thing happen. Um, you know, you, you talked a little bit, um, and at another, there's another question here. I think I know the answer to this. How do you feel about defunding police departments? Uh, that's anarchy, Chris. And that's, that's just, it's, police departments need to be changed. And there's some things, you know, they're good police. They're certainly good cops. Most of them probably 99.9999% are good cops. But you have a rogue cop up there in Minneapolis who got the whole country fired up. Now we can do some reforms. I mean, I've had some colleagues who've been, one guy who's law enforcement in Minnesota, he said, yeah, I live there. Cost Minneapolis did not have a good reputation. And that starts at the top. So for example, uh, one thing that we saw with this tragic thing with Mr. Floyd was two of the police officers, the, the four there were brand new. And they just sat there and watched it happen. Now they've been charged, but my point is in the Navy, I was in the Navy for nine years, the most junior said when he first showed up and said, you're a safety officer. If you see something wrong, something that makes you concerned, speak up. It may be stupid, but you won't be ridiculed for it. You'll be encouraged to speak up. We should do that with our police force. Hey, young guys there, just say, dude, get off this throat. He can't breathe. And so they're sitting there going, wow, it's my third week out here. I don't know what to do. I'm a young guy. I'll just sit back. And this guy's you know, just say, say it. And also, Crucially, make sure that this goes higher up the chain of command. It's not just a bad cop. Hey, chief, you sign a document saying this guy's good to go on patrol by himself. He's out there because of you. You should lose your job. Like had a guy, uh, the aircraft carrier Harris Truman, the skipper, lost his job because COVID-19 broke out upon a ship. Could he control that? No, but it happened on a ship. The skipper's responsible. Same thing on the police force. Happens on your watch, bad cop. How come you got them out there? That'll make them that attitude of, hey, speak up and get more stronger when the guy at the top knows I'll lose my job if I don't encourage the younger guys to speak up if they see something wrong. And the older guys, or we're guys who are a little abusive that sort of back off knowing that, wow, I'm gonna lose my job and take a lot of people down with me. So this, you know, it's, it's a culture that has to change. That's gonna take some time, but defunding the cops is just not the answer. That'll be, that's anarchy. And some people I've talked to, colleagues who served in Iraq and said, they've seen anarchy. It is not a pretty thing. It's like a Hollywood movie. People just getting gunned down right in front of you. Looters happening. It's just total, it's Armageddon. So we can't go down that road. Well, and I imagine there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, I'm, I'm sure Congress is just full of ideas right now. Oh yeah, yep, yep. <laughs> and so what- There's well, probably a hundred bills out there right now. Yeah. Yeah. Anything, anything getting traction? Well, there's a couple that the Democrats have a bill on the House, have going to have a hearing on it today. We had a call from our side on it yesterday. It's very positive. There's some differences for sure, but a lot of things they're talking about, like the, uh, the choke holds, you know, the why is that liable force and sort of ways to change the culture. For example, Canada, New Jersey fired their whole police force, but people say that, but they rebuilt them. You know, basically got rid of the rogue actors, but fired all of them and started picking the ones that came back and got this whole new attitude about, you know, see something, say something, as opposed to being so in inclusive, exclusive, that they've turned that around. So maybe something like that, you know, just get, get that whole attitude of, hey, listen, you're a young guy, you're on patrol with a senior guy, he doing something you think is wrong, say something. Maybe not to him, but get back to his and say, listen, he did this or he did, you know, whatever. But that did happen in Minneapolis for sure. The young guy just watched it knowing that this guy's dying. He said, I can't breathe. He's being choked. And Chris, was his crime? He passed a $20 hot check. It's nothing worth deadly force. I mean, it's a forgery. Well, you know, one of the issues, I guess, what folks see, uh, the, the, you know, there is not a monolithic police force in whatever you do in Congress is not might might touch individual police departments, but it's not going to be, you know, there's not one police department, um, and yep, those yep. Are, that's a that's done at, at a at a at a at a city by city, a county and state level. Um, uh, you know, we got a question that just showed up here. 
if a state such as Minnesota is calling for the defunding and dismantling of their police, uh, if they do that, would Congress step in to stop them? I, I don't know that you can. Yeah, Chris, we'd probably take some money from them just to encourage them to keep some sort of law and order. But, uh, you know, we'll get deal with this for sure because it's, and Chris, you know, I have no idea what Afro Americans have gone through, but I've had some good friends like my great buddy in the Navy, who's now a two star admiral, great sailor, just an icon. He was driving through Beverly Hills a couple of years ago, got pulled over as a c c Captain Navy, basically a, a bird colonel, all the other services. Through Beverly Hills, a nice car. Why was he pulled over? Well, because he was black. And we're gonna stop that racial. I've never dealt with that. I have never been pulled over just because of my skin color. And after this happened, Chris got a letter from a constituent. He said kind of the same scenarios up there in San Francisco. Successful black business owner got pulled over 13 times in one day. One day, driving through a nice neighborhood up there in San Francisco just because he was black. And I don't know why that happens, but that has got to stop. I mean, I've never experienced that. I I hear it now. I'm learning more, but please, 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 let's have compassion. Realize this is a problem. Our African American brothers and sisters are not, so for some reason, law enforcement profiles them, does things they don't do to Chris Rowe or Pete Olson. That has to stop. Mm -hmm. Blind justice. Hey, Pete, I've got a question here. Um, I, 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 uh, I'm unfamiliar with this, but the uh, can you can you touch on the Align Act? Yeah, the Align Act, Chris. That's uh, that's going through the Senate right now. I'm on that bill in the House, and that bill, basically, Chris. Let me get the numbers for you. It's a S thirty two ninety six. This is by Pat Toomey up there in Pennsylvania. But basically, what this does is allows long-term investment, it basically gives preference to long-term investments because right now it's we're kind of short-term, short-term, short-term. And this allows tax deduction of longer-term investments to make sure you're encouraged to take that risk, basically a long-term risk, get some recovery, but something that a little slower than DC wants, but still if the money's gonna come. And uh, we have, I think 20 or so co-sponsors on the house side now. And this will be a good start. Would this help us recover from this corona crisis, the, the COVID-19, because another arrow to quiver, so to speak, to help out businesses with a tax incentive to get more money in their business and get out of this, out of this situation. Well, good, excellent. Um, and. and we, we've talked about a little bit of this. I, I, I'm going to step back, Pete, and, and think, you know, uh, this was, uh, this is the first office you ran for, District 22. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yep. <laughs> a little too late to tell you, what are you doing? Uh, what, what do you, what, what advice do you give other folks who are running for office? Maybe, maybe, you know, Congress or, or state or something local. What, what, what advice do you give those folks? All the same, Chris. Remember, we the people. Mm -hmm. You're a public servant. You're not, you serve them. And also I tell people, especially running for Congress, um, get your butts home every time you can. Go out, engage, especially this diverse community. You're going to have to know, for example, Chris, uh, you're going to have to probably learn how to say namaste. That's hello, goodbye to Indian Americans. You may learn about a festival called Holy from that same group. You'll know about Ramadan. you know about Passover. you know the fact that um, Asian, there's a big uh, boat festival here, Dragon Boat Festival on, on the Floor Lake over there. Um, it's called the Cultural Arts Festival, but it's a big kite contest, big contest for Asian Americans in our parks there. My point is go engage and embrace this diversity because it's such a special thing. You learn so much more about America, what makes us great by engaging and come back home. Get your butt home. Don't, don't stay in the beltway. And don't be afraid to laugh. I mean, just, yeah. you know, don't be afraid to be, you know, like maybe go to the Chamber of Commerce gal, you put a little Devo hat. That's like the rock group Devo. Uh, yeah, well, Pete, what I've always enjoyed about uh, coming up at the Chamber of Commerce, your office, is you've always you've always pointed out to your desk and say this is your desk, and so we've really appreciated that. Uh, Big side behind there, remember Ray Aguilar put his feet up on the desk and kick back, but yeah, you know, Ray, it's your desk. You do that. 
Yeah, you probably should have called security on Ray. That's that <laughs> Oh man. Uh, well, um, so if we talked about, you know, going, uh, in, in, and again, I'm not, uh, I know you got a lot of time, you got a lot of activity, a lot of things you're trying to accomplish before you leave office. What, what do you, have you thought of any plans after office? Chris, I'll be back home here. I mean, my wife, Nancy has been such a champion. We've been married now for 26 years and our first year of marriage was okay. How did I marry for seven months? I'm going overseas for six months. Okay. Came back home for six months right before Christmas. Hey, we're home. Our squad is being shut down. Cold War is ending. Yay. We'll here be in Hawaii for months. I was ordered to DC within three weeks of coming home. Okay, Nancy, pack up all our stuff. Come across the ocean. Come across the country. Get there before Christmas. And Chris, she has done everything I've to support my career. It's time to support her career. And also her mom lives with us now and she's got real issues with dementia. So it's time for me to come home. So I'll do something out there. Mommy says, you got to still work, but I'll do it here. Maybe with, you know, the old John Noel group out there. No, I'm just kidding around. I don't know what county skills. But something I care about locally. Oh, very good. Very good. Yeah, we talked about, uh, you know, the, a, a lot of things going on and, 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 I can only imagine the number of bills being um, uh, put in right now. What, what do you think realistically Congress will accomplish before the end of the year? Not a whole lot, Chris. We're getting to the election mode right now. And um, it's got to be the hate act I've got out there, minor act compared to some of the big ones, has a chance because it's bipartisan, bicameral. We're addressing transportation, though. Gray's going to talk tomorrow about transportation infrastructure. That's been things both parties want to address, but how to pay for that's been sort of a breakdown. The other part wants more taxes. We want more private sector, and that's, but that may happen. We'll do something called the National Defense Authorization Bill that gives DOD policy, not money per se. Mm -hmm. We have to fund the government after September 30th to avoid a shutdown. Uh, we've always done now, it's called a CR, continue resolution, just kick the can down the road. We'll probably do something like that just to get through the elections. And the elections, who knows? You see the polls just up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And, but, um, you know, there's not a lot of hope for nothing. It's got to be bipartisan. And, um, you know, again, the PPP stuff has been that way. The COVID-19 crisis has been that way. There's been some politics as well. But basically, we came together on four bills, now the little bill to kind of alter the, the, the percentage of spending money against 75. That was not a spending bill per se, but change the numbers. That may happen to more tweaks just because what we learned for you guys. Hey, this is not working. Okay, let's change that. Again, that was just one dissent in the House. Just one person said no. It's like, I don't know why he did that, but. Everyone's got their reasons, right? Go tell your small business, okay, I, I want to hurt you. I you didn't want to do that, but still, it's just, I don't want to know why somebody did that. I do, I do, have, a, I do have a comment on here about uh, you being uh, the best depot at the, uh, at the Chambers uh, Gala, so <laughs> good job. Whip it good. Yeah. Uh, here's a question. Um, uh, and, and I don't know if this is in your in your um, uh, uh, wheelhouse, but I'll ask it to you anyway. Um, will contract tracing be mandatory and pushed through as a law or be voluntary? Good question. That's right now, Chris, that's not been a federal issue. That's been local. I mean, KP George, our judge, has got a tracing effort going out there. Greg Abbott, our governor's done one. I think we'll give them money, but as you mentioned earlier, if DC gets involved, it's, hey, one size fits all. Well, that may work in Illinois, but that doesn't work in Texas, or that may work in tiny, small, Vermont where parents live, but that will work in Florida. And so let's help out, let's give them policy guidance, maybe some funds, but let them decide how to spend it. Because we have to actually track this too, because right now we don't know where this, where this is coming from. Our nursing homes, guys, got, remember those, they've been hit hard. Our nursing homes have been hit hard. We're trying to get them. It's right now, too, Chris, with hurricane season here, a lot of guys in nursing homes said, man, if I have to evacuate people with COVID, that's not going to fly. <laughs> I'll be just keep going, keep going. Don't stop here. Keep that. So we're going to make sure those people can't get out. 
Then Greg Abbott, governor, is working on a plan to do that as well. That came out when he announced some stuff about Harvey, about the hurricane season and, this week. Yeah, and I guess a lot of folks, there's, you know, there's, there's things that the, the federal government does and things that the local government does. Um, and, and sometimes we get confused as to who's doing what. Yep, yep, yep. I think probably the, the, the default is, you know, let the states handle that. Uh, if they can't handle it, we turn it over to the feds. Remember, Chris, our title of our country, the United States of America, not the federal government of America. It's the United States. The emphasis was on power with the states. Right. Very good. Okay. So let's see. Um, I got kind of comment right there. there. Um, I think we talked about your, uh, your your most favorite thing about District 22, which, which you appreciate. No, no, no. Here's the one I wanted. That's, that's the one. The people, the it. people, the people, the people. I know you have your people. I love it. No, it is. No, you're right. And it is the people. I'm, I'm playing with you. But, but what, what's your biggest accomplishment? What do you think is your biggest accomplishment in, in District 22? Well, Chris, there's two accomplishments. Being a member of Congress and passing laws, it's not a law per se. It got in law, but it was a big deal for our hometown of Sugarland. We have the best EMS vehicles in the country. We have two or three of our own EMS vehicles now. We got caught by DC. We bought these things in about 2013, Chris, to bring them online. They've been a moratorium because of Medicare fraud, Medicaid fraud in this region. No more EMS vehicles for anybody. No more. It expires January 13th, 15th, whatever, of 2014. And we be in Sugarland. I thought DC will keep their word. Let's get these vehicles, get that reimbursement part of our financial portfolio. And then they extended the deadline after we bought the vehicles. All of a sudden, we're in crisis. And so I was able to get a piece of legislation in a big bill, just a little paragraph, basically giving preference or allowing, pulling out that moratorium governments, because all these guys were private contractors, shysters, worked with lawyers and Cat in a, in a tow trucks to get some doctor or some, you know, here, doctor, here's a patient. You get my tow truck, you get my doctor, all through Medicare. And this have rampant. We're the worst part of the country. We haven't had the moratorium. But our city's not like that. If a, our city messes up, you know, Joe Zimmerman is fired. He doesn't get reelected. Mm -hmm. And so we got a bill in there, got that, got that going, allows Streamline to be reimbursed with Medicare and Medicaid money. And I like to quote Alan Bogart, our long-term city managers. He left, he said, was from a service perspective, the city take responsibility for ambulance service through the fire department about five years ago, I think is one of the most impactful decisions that we have made during my time. And that happened because of my people, my staff, Chris, got that thing in the bill that allowed Fort Bend to get that money and those ambulances because they're driving our response times in Fort Bend here in Sugarland are slower all across the county it's lower because they don't have to worry about Fort Bend we're better and that's my proudest list and then also just little things Chris that make a small difference but matter like have a post office named here off of Grants Lake after Garrett Gamble a proud Austin High Bulldog killed in combat when he's 20 years old and all his mom wanted was somebody to remember his son got that done also, apparently, the post office for Eddie Panya. Remember, he was killed in line of duty, run over by a woman who was out of, drunk out of her mind. And just little things like that that matter. And then, you know, just showing people to listen. Congress people, they're people that work for you. And don't forget that. And if you're an elected official, be a person. Don't be a rubber stamp. Tell some jokes. Smile. Pull your finger apart sometime, you know, like that little finger trick. <laughs> I, um, uh, <laughs> no, no, gotcha, fingers. Chris, bro, gotcha. Uh, you got, you did get me, you got me there. We, we, we talked about PPP. You, you, you showed us, you showed us that, that huge number of the money still out there. Uh, we, we talked today earlier, um, uh, you know, some, there it is, there it is. That's 130, that's a billion with a B? Billion with a B. Billion with a B. And so th there's money out there still for, for these, these um, uh, businesses that are hurting, that are yep, hurt, yep, they, yep. Can, they can get on this. That you know, that's important. And, and you know, we, 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 see, um, we see reports 
and we see reports taken back and we see this and we see that and all, you know, the PPP is out of money. No, it's not out of money. It's not even close to out of money. I mean, there's plenty of money in there. But talk a little, I mean, give us, give us a pep talk on this, man. We, these guys got to get after this PPP money if it's available. Yeah, Chris, remember it came out quickly. The money was gone with it. Uh, it was like almost half, got half a, I think it was like $350 billion was gone in less than a week. Now that's what the door first opened up. Got that second charge in there, it was like $250 billion. That's the money that's still out there because the, most the guys got their help. They started readjusting. But as you made the point, Chris, that money's out there. Yeah. And we're still recovery. You guys, a lot of you guys are still going paycheck to paycheck, hour to hour. I mean, will people come in my restaurant? Will people come in my small business? Are they going to come back like they were coming before? We'll move online. And so, as I mentioned earlier, don't be afraid to ask for help. Go to Chris Fro, go to Carrie, go to our chamber, say, guys, how do I apply for PPP? Call up the SBA, drop by our office right there. It's in town center, okay, right there by the city hall. We'll help you out. Then you go support a restaurant there. Walk around the corner. You know, so... Excellent. No, no, that's good. You that's know, cool. vinyl. Yeah. Turquoise. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Japaneros. You got it. All good. All open. Escalantes. I mean, you got them all there. It's that's right. Very good. Very good. Well, Pete, I, man, we we appreciate you being out here today. I know you're I know you're busy. I know there's there's still stuff going on. So I, I tell everyone, you know, when when... When, when things are closed down, it seems like uh, folks are busier than ever. Um, and I know that was our case during the, uh, during the actual, the meat of the shutdown. And I know you guys are, are, are jumping yeah. through hoops there trying to get together. You know, you, you talked about, um, you know, what, what does Congress look like going forward? What does any public meeting look like going forward? You, you touched on it a little bit. What, I mean, what, so you foresee in the near future, I guess in DC, you talked about the, um, uh, the, the peak or, or uh, of things kind of hitting about mid July. So that, that's going to, I mean, that'll severely affect you, what you guys are doing, or just the operations. Yeah, Chris, we have had, we had one hearing in Congress since the crisis hit. That was judiciary. That happened last week, but they found out there's only one room that we can social distance to the entire Capitol. It's called the Capitol Visitor Center Auditorium, basically, was built in the early 2000s after 9-11 to be the place where Congress went kind of a bunker. Uh -huh. And like our hearing rooms won't comply. I mean, we sit yeah. side by side. So our witnesses are side by side. So we're moving online now, but there's challenges gonna be there. And the people wanna see us in, you know, they wanna go to the Capitol and be able to tour the Capitol. Right now it's locked down, no public can come to the Capitol. They can walk around the grounds and we're struggling. And we're gonna have, mm -hmm. we'll have our first hearings tomorrow or, I'm sorry, Friday, uh, there was the science committee uh, doing some stuff with the FEMA fire grants, but we'll see how it works out. It worked out a couple of times. We, we have to figure it just, kick, Chris, because it's a whole new world with this coronavirus. Mm. And oh, by the way, there's some science that's kind of ramped up again. And the flu's coming. Yay! More good news. <laughs> flu season's about to hit. Tornado, turkey season's here. What else is coming? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. It's uh, who, who's writing the script for 2020? Um, then you go back to the writing room. Uh, uh, Pete, how about contacting your office and getting in touch with you guys? How, how's that? How's that working now? The best thing is online because most people have access to a computer that's instantaneous. And my email address is Olson O L S O N dot house dot gov G O V. The person who handles me back home, her name is Ellie Skelton. And Ellie's on the call here, I do believe. Ellie, well, you can go down to town center, support a restaurant, support a small business, drop by your office there. It's not quite the chair like in D.C., not quite the activate, not quite the scenery, but still your chair. Kick around and then, you know, don't break anything. Don't pull right angular. Yeah. <laughs> well, very good. Okay. Well, Pete, uh, we really... Uh, we really appreciate you being here. We appreciate the job you've done uh, in Congress for us uh, over, over the years. Uh, and it has been, uh, it's been, it's been great to have you serve us as a, a, as a true public servant. We appreciate Well, thank you, Chris. But, you know, it's been an honor in my life, the highest honor to represent these great people. But just because I leave Congress doesn't mean I don't care anymore. I have that heart. I care. 
And the good thing now, Chris, is I can kind of unleash. I can ask for money way beyond limits of things I can't do with elected officials. Help out the Chamber of Commerce or local charity. I can, I'm kind of going to be turned loose. So look out, Fort Bend County. Pete's coming. He's home. He's coming. All right, coming home. We appreciate that, Pete. Well, thank you. And also thank you, uh, uh, David Aguilar uh, and Republic uh, Services for their generosity. We appreciate you guys being out here today. Um, I want you to, I want to make everyone aware of a couple of things. Um, uh, tomorrow, as uh, the Congressman said, uh, the Infrastructure Division is hosting a webinar with Commissioner uh, Grady Prestige. Um, and he's going to discuss the infrastructure developments in uh, Precinct 2. Uh, that's going to begin at 8 o'clock. Uh, same same bat time, same bat location right here. Uh, on the 15th, the Business and Professional uh, Division will be hosting a webinar. Um, uh, Fort Bend County supports small business uh, grant program. That's going to begin at noon, uh, and that's the uh, sort of the follow-up to the, this morning's. Uh, you see Pete there with our 15-star rating there. <laughs> if you're interested in joining our webinars, please review the Chamber calendar, fortbendchamber.com, for additional details. Uh, thanks for getting this, uh, this conversation with Pete Olson. Uh, the recording of this webinar is going to be on 48 hours on the Chamber website under the Government Divisions tab. Y'all have a great day. And Pete, thanks a bunch for that 15-star that rating. You earned it, man. You guys earned it. No lies. <laughs>